Uh, Win Jones, not Alan Win Jones. It's Win Jones. Uh, so Rory Sutherland starts that game. Mako Vunapola uh, onto the bench, and the Lions apparently don't plan to call up another loose head to the wider squad at present. Brian O'Driscoll will be alongside Neil Tracy for live commentary of that game from five o'clock, and Alan Quinlan will hop on as well uh, with myself and Brian for uh, a bit of a look ahead to that game from four o'clock this afternoon. We'll keep you up to date as well on all the action just underway at Galway versus Waterford at Seppa Stadium in Turles. Jim Skehill watching that game for us, and we'll have Brendan Bugler watching Clare versus Cork at the LIT Gaelic rounds later on as well. So plenty more still to come. Now, though, it's time for the Olympics show. The Olympics show on OTB Sports with Indeed, proud partner of Team Ireland. Yes, as you heard there, you're watching the Olympics show on OTB Sports with Indeed, proud sponsor and partner of Team Ireland. We're live every day across the next three weeks across all of our social channels. You'll find us on youtube.com forward slash off the ball, on facebook.com forward slash off the ball, and as well on Twitter at off the ball. It's all with thanks to Indeed, who are proud to support Team Ireland at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Indeed believes the world works better when people are given every opportunity to unleash their true talents. And the hashtag is Talent Unleashed. Time to welcome uh, to the Olympics show this afternoon, live from Tokyo in Japan, Brendan O'Brien, the Irish Examiner, senior sports journalist and columnist. Afternoon or uh, evening, I guess, Brendan. Good night, indeed. Good night. Shane. How are you? Not too bad, Brendan. Keeping well. <laughs> you've been uh, you've been keeping an eye on this uh, Irish women's hockey match. They're uh, they're going to plan so far against South Africa. It has to be said. Yeah, it looks good for them. Um, I'm no expert on hockey, but um, good start for them. Uh, obviously, a huge game. It's their first ever game in the Olympic Games. It's um, a game that they have to win because South Africa is the lowest rank or highest rank, whatever way you want to put a team in the group. And, um, yeah, they have to get the win. They also probably have to beat India next Friday if they want to get through to the to the quarterfinals. So it's a game they had to win, uh, their first game in the Olympics. So a lot of, um, you know, a possibility that they might find the occasion a little bit big, but it didn't look like that in the first quarter. And um, they went ahead after nine minutes through uh, Roshin Upton from the first penalty corner. So good start. Uh, you must feel like a man unleashed yourself. You're you're out of the, the, the hotel quarantine and you're you're out and about in Tokyo, so it must feel uh, quite nice. I, I know you watched the, the opening ceremony, for example, and Kelly Harrington and Brendan Irvine carrying that uh, Irish flag uh, from the hotel, so it must be quite nice to be out and about. That's great to be out and about. I mean, um got here on Tuesday. By the time we got into the hotel, it would have been, I think, about 8 o'clock in the evening, and um, then you have three days of quarantine after that. Now, uh, the whole ad hoc nature of it is quite strange because some journalists have come over with zero days quarantine. Others have been told they have to do three days. We've heard stories of journalists who were deemed to be uh, close contacts of people on the flight who've been subjected to 14 days quarantine. So there's a lot of confusion out here. There's talk about people just jumping in cabs on the street when we're meant to be getting official transport for the first 14 days in country. So look, three days quarantine wasn't a huge um it wasn't a huge thing to have to put up with. The nature of these events, as you know yourselves, there's a lot of prep work goes into it. I spent three days uh, basically writing in the hotel room, but it's great to be out today. I was at the rowing this morning. Um, great to be out there just to see, you know, a team that has a lot of expectation on its shoulders and uh, mixed results in the first two days, but the, the rowers who were good were, were very, very good. Like I, I was speaking to, to Will O'Callaghan earlier on the news round and Talking about Paul O'Donovan and Fintan McCarthy and the fact that they are such fancied uh, Irish medal hopes and like Brendan, it's not something we're used to. Like we're not expected to to normally lead from the front in Olympics and and to be expected to win medals. But with these pair, that is certainly the case. Uh, big time, absolutely big time. And and you've, you've you've kind of touched on something that I think a lot of us over here have really noticed. Not just Paul O'Donovan and, and Fintan McCarthy because they are like you say they're. They're, you know, roaring favourites for the lightweight double skulls, and they, they acted today like they were just out on the lake in Skibbereen or the river in Skibbereen, and just, you know, no, no, you know, eyes of the world on them, and they just breezed over the line, looked really, really comfortable. But a lot of the Irish athletes over here, pre games and while they're here, they've been talking about it in 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 ways we're not accustomed to. There's no, you know, tipping the hat and saying, oh, "Thanks very much, sir. Thanks very much, sir." You know thanks for having us kind of job and sure we'll do our best it's it's more of a uh, i suppose there's more confidence in the irish athletes over here um not bordering on cockiness just uh, you know not afraid to kind of stick their chests out and say well why shouldn't it be us um and you know how the results go for those athletes i think is immaterial in that sense i think it's good to hear them say it i mean one perfect example would be um jack woolley who mm. talked about wanting to be at home in tala and on Monday with an Olympic medal around his neck. Now, 
didn't work out for him and what a horrible, horrible situation that was for him today in the Taekwondo. But it's great to see athletes talk like that. You know, it's not it's not Conor McGregor saying we're not here to take part, we're here to take over, but it's not that kind of putting ourselves down and, you know, the the you know, the Irish kind of lack of self confidence that maybe we would have had on, on the world stage before. So it's great to see and you know, there, there, there's a lot of metal shots still to come over a number of sports over the next couple of weeks. So right up, I think, until maybe the last day of the Games, I think Kelly Harrington's final is due there. So let's hope that we keep our interest all the way through to that. Like That's a very fair point, the, the, the self-confidence thing. And like, as you said, like the Irish psyche is almost to, you know, if someone bumps into us, we apologise. It's very, yeah. uh, <laughs> hold the hands up and just say sorry. But yeah. with, with the likes of, as you said, like Jack Woolley, Reese McClanahan, uh, Paula Donovan as well, like characters and fellas who are uh, supremely confident and it goes against every single grain like it that that's great to see I like even I saw yourself writing about Paul Donovan before and talking about the fact that he, he's rowing because he enjoys it and you know he's, he's telling people we're here doing this for ourselves like that is that is a fantastic attitude to have it's brilliant and and it kind of goes across the team as well I mean if you talk to a lot of them um, I, I think it was Philip Doyle who again with um, Roland Byrne hasn't had a great two days but before the, the Olympics he was talking about how the momentum can carry through from one one member of the team to the other and he was talking about that just in the context of the rowing team how you know confidence can can kind of soar through it and that can that can happen in Team Ireland as well I mean we're still in a situation here where um, members of the team who might be in minority sports will be sharing um, apartments with people they might have never met before in their lives because that's just the way it is. Logistically, they couldn't give everybody a, a single room despite all the COVID challenges. And that does, you know, fear is contagious, they say. It's a virus in itself, but so is so is confidence and so is enjoyment and all these kind of things that we can't quite put our finger on. Um, so it'd be great, you know, Jack Woolley not, to, not being able to do the business for himself today is a huge disappointment. But there's still a couple of performances in there that you know, have the potential to kind of get the team going. I mean, you saw Kurt Walker after his win today. It was brilliant. I really enjoyed that. Um, he was asked about meeting the, the top seed, the Uzbeki fighter in the next round. He said, well, he's got two arms and two legs. And he said, we'll come up with a plan and we'll beat him. Not not we'll come up with a plan to beat him. We'll come up with a plan and we'll beat him. Now, the boxers have always been a bit of a different breed and, and an air of cockiness about them. But, I mean, it's great. It's great to hear and it's great to see. And, and let's just hope that more of them than not can kind of live up to the, the pre-games expectations yeah and certainly the 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 boxing expectations are always quite high for for the irish fighters and great to see like even um aiden walsh getting a bye to the last 16 in the, in the welterweight division and of course his uh, sister michaela and kelly harrington get the bye anyway as seeds but like kelly harrington this could be this could be uh, an absolutely massive uh, tokyo games for her because uh, i don't want to to curse her and say this is her katie taylor london 2012 moment but the expectations are, are pretty high for Kelly Harrington, Brendan. They, they really are. Like, you know, I mean, K- Kelly Harrington doesn't need any introduction to, to a lot of sports fans. But for, for a lot of people who'd only cast the odd eye over it, she's not in the Katie Taylor level. She's probably not in the public consciousness in, in, in the Mick Conlon or the Paddy Barnes level either or, or the Kenny Egan. Let's be honest about it. That's not to put her down as a fighter at all or what she's done. She does have a profile. She's a brilliant fighter. She's a lovely person as well. But... This boxing team in general doesn't have the profile of maybe any of the three teams going back up to and including Beijing in 2008. And there is, you know, they've kind of not fallen off the radar with, with your floating sports voter, but there is a kind of an expectation that maybe the rowing will take over as Ireland's medal factory, as it's been called. Um, so there's a lot of really good boxers in this team, guys who've won and girls who've won European medals. Uh, and to win a European medal, you know yourself, Shane, it's, it's as hard nearly as, uh, probably is as hard as winning an Olympic medal the way the, the, the Federation is set up. So Kelly Harrington is the flag bearer, forgive the pun, after the, the opening ceremony for that team. She is the best known. She is a former world champion. She is somebody who has the talent, the top seed. You said it yourself, she's a buy into the next round. So it's set up for her, um, and I'm sure she loves the fact that it's set up for her. And um, I think it was Bernard Dunn, the high performance director with the boxing, was, was asked about the draw um, with her getting the buy. And he said, yeah, that's all brilliant, but she still has to go and perform. And I'm sure she knows that herself. Uh, and even uh, one uh, event this morning was the road race as well, which, look, it's a bit of a lottery, but that, and I think Team <laughs> Ireland even uh, described it as punishing in their own Twitter post. And Dan Martin... I mean, a very respectable 16th in, in that 234-kilometre race and a very good effort uh, from Dan Martin, it has to be said. 
Yeah, because, I mean, the previous best for, for Ireland in the road race in the men was uh, 13, which Dan himself got five years ago now, and Kieran Power back in, I think it was Athens in 04. And you, you, you hit the nail on the head there. It is a real lottery. And just talking to Eddie Dunbar, who was in the race for us as well, that's exactly how he put it. Like, you know, anything can happen in the road race. And just the nature of it as well, the first 100k of it was off the flat, so it was kind of like there was nothing really going to happen too much. And then you had the gradient up to 4,800 metres. And, uh, I mean, uh, just looking at the quotes from Dan Martin afterwards, he said, look, we couldn't have done anything better um, Nico Roach said previous games he'd been he, he'd been kind of you know looking to get himself front and centre. He was happy to kind of play the the domestic role there for for Dan Martin today. And and Dan himself said when push came to shove, he just didn't quite have enough that he wanted in his legs. But I mean the heat here today as well, Shane. Um, when, when I was getting the bus this morning, um, I was looking at it going. I don't know what all the forecasts are about. It's cloudy and it's a little bit muggy, but literally in the space of three minutes in the bus, it was bright blue skies and the, the sun beaming through the window, 33, 34 degrees, you know. And and that's what the humidity at the lower end of the spectrum is what was expected. It was maybe 50, 59, 60 degrees, um, 60 percent here today, and it could be up as far as 80. So it wasn't even as humid as it could be. And you try and do a, a road race of over whatever 250 kilometers in, in those conditions, absolutely punishing. And the nature of the road race in the Olympics, it's a one-off. It's not a Tour de France. Anybody can happen. And Eddie Dunbar spoke about that before the race when he mentioned Mark Cavendish back in 2012, who was a raging hot favorite, sprint specialist. He was caught on the hop by a couple of guys making the breakaway, and I think he finished in the mid to high 20s. So, very respectable effort for Ireland today. Yeah, I can imagine the heat off the tarmac in those road races as well. And I even I saw an interview with, with uh, Fintan McCarthy and, and Paula Donovan earlier talking about yeah. they were saying they were well prepared and, and saying that they had the, the heaters on in the, in the bathroom in, the, um, in their camp in Italy, preparing for humidity and preparing for heat, which is at least something that they're, they're well prepared for it. Uh, so, it's undoubtedly going to be a factor. Uh, Brendan, like, like you were writing in, in one of your columns uh, in the Irish Examiner in the last day or two about uh, generational talents in, 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 in Olympic Games and, and what these Olympic Games are remembered for. Like you mentioned by name, people like Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka and uh, Elliot Kipchoge. Like, even aside from the Irish interest, there are so many big names that we uh, can look forward to seeing and, and probably could prove to be exactly what the world re needs right now over the next few weeks. I think so, definitely. There's obviously been a lot of pessimism about the Games, questions, should it go ahead? Questions that myself and other people here would still, you know, ask ourselves, should we be here? Should the Games be going on? Do the Japanese people really want it? You hear different versions of that from from people in Japan, to be quite honest. Um, we don't know the full story. I know there's some Speedway event going on outside of the state of Tokyo with something like 11,000 punters at it or, or whatever. So, you know, people are looking at that and going, why are we why are we having empty stadiums in Tokyo? Uh, you know, if we can question that. I don't think we should be. I think it's up to the, the people in Japan and Tokyo to decide that. We all know they were kind of placed over a barrel because of their, their commitments to the Olympic Games and the money they would have lost or had to fork out in, if, if, if they hadn't gone ahead. But, you know, I think... That, while the, the nature of the controversy and the questions pre-games have been very, very different this time, there's always questions, there's always controversies about the Olympics. Should cities be putting up all this money? I mean, Rio the last time, I mean, look at all the, the, the pictures we've seen of stadiums going to rack and ruin since Rio in 2016. There's loads of questions, but when, when the action starts and the likes of Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles and all these people, and Paula Donovan, another generational talent, when, when these people go up on the stage... I think it's okay for us to kind of say, well, yeah, I still have reservations, but that doesn't mean I can't just sit down and look at this talent. I mean, you talk about gener generational talent. Somebody like Simone Biles is beyond that. Mm. She has redefined our uh, gymnastics, redefined it. She is the Stephen Cluxton of, our, uh, of gymnastics. That's no mean boast. Um, these are the kind of people who are popping up on our screen at the moment. So, yeah, you can, you can hold reservations about the games and everything around it, but... There's no doubt about it. The games never fails to get us off our seat. And not just those generational talents. Somebody will pop up in an Irish context and in a world context and they'll make the world sit up in those. Very finally, Brendan, I mean, you, you've written in, in the, the last week or so about, uh, I guess, combining expectation with realism in terms of medal hopes for the Irish athletes. And, you know, two medals from, from Rio 2016. What, what are your predictions or expectations in terms of a medal haul this time uh, around? Uh, I knew you were going to ask me that. I've been thinking about I've been thinking about it all day because when you look at today, I mean, Jack Woolley was one of the guys who was considered 
maybe an outside bet, but a, but a decent outside bet. That's obviously not going to happen now. Ronan Byrne and Philip Doyle, we mentioned earlier in the, the heavyweight double skulls. Those guys won a world silver in Linz in the rowing in 2019. Um, they seem to have come, come into a, a bit of form at, at one of the World Cup events in Lucerne. They're struggling just to make the semi-final. I mean, they said it themselves. Where it's just not clicking. And I've heard somebody else say that today. I can't remember quite who. It's just not clicking. So you'll have athletes who it doesn't work for that we expect things from. And you'll have others like maybe Thomas Barr in Rio who finished fourth in the 400 metres hurdles who will totally blow us out of the water. But if you look at it, Sunita Pushpura is probably a very safe bet for a medal all going well. Paula Donovan, Fintan McCarthy. We had Reese McLenaghan with a brilliant... Um, Brilliant display today in the gymnastics, even though he was criticising his own display as well. And he had a brilliant score. So there's three that you'd be you'd be very confident about. The women's four in, in the rowing today were excellent. Um, they have a really good shot at, at a medal. You know, the, the show jumping team, Carl Daniels in the eventing. One of the golfers could do something over four days. Plenty of talent there. I'm probably, I, I, know, I know I'm leaving somebody out here, but I think uh, maybe five or six medals would be a good, good haul here and all going well. We talked about momentum a bit earlier. If people can start feeding off each other, maybe they can get a bit more. But that's not to say things don't go wrong and, and they end up with a two or a three. Because what you have to remember about Rio, yeah, there was only two medals. But I think there was 15 top tens or finalists. Um, and the margins at the very top are, are, as we all know, very, very small. Yeah, we take we take your hand off for five or six medals without a shadow of a doubt. You Absolutely, have, you have me optimistic, Brendan. Listen, we'll we'll let you get back to the <laughs> back to the hockey. Great stuff as always. Thanks a million. We'll check in again across the next few weeks, no doubt. That's Brendan O'Brien there, the Irish Examiner, senior sports journalist and uh, columnist as well. Uh, a lovely treat to bring you now as well uh, on the Olympic show because a little earlier I had uh, the chance to speak with Kathleen Noble who's representing Uganda in the rowing but has uh, some uh, strong Irish heritage. So uh, have a look. The Olympic show on OTB Sports with Indeed, proud partner of Team Ireland. All right, well, you are watching the Olympics show on OTB Sports with Indeed, proud partner of Team Ireland. We're live every day across the next three weeks across all of our social channels across the Olympic Games in Tokyo 2020. It is all with thanks to Indeed, who are proud to support Team Ireland at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Indeed believes the world works better when people are given every opportunity to unleash their true talents, and the hashtag is Talent Unleashed. It's not an Irish Olympian we have uh, on the show for you this afternoon. It's, in fact, a rower representing Uganda. Kathleen Noble, though, has uh, Irish heritage, it's fair to say, very strong Irish heritage, uh, and living over in Salt Lake City in America as well. Uh, delighted to have you on the show, Kathleen. How are you keeping? Very well, thanks. You're, Thanks for having me. Not a problem at all. It's a pleasure. Um, a bit of a conflicted identity because you're, you're representing Uganda. You're, you're, I was reading the, uh, the Salt Lake Tribune describing you as a Salt Lake woman over in Utah, and now the Irish are claiming you. So this must get all uh, very confusing for you. <laughs> I know. I feel like I've got an awful lot of attention for uh, someone at my level. And uh, being uh, represented on three different continents, it's quite exciting. And how, how has the, uh, the, the Tokyo Olympics been going for you so far? I know you were uh, competing against our own Sunita Paspur in, the, in, the, uh, in Heat 2 um, the other day, and you were in the repechage as well today. So it's been, a, it's been uh, an interesting start for you, and, and, and straight in at the deep end against uh, some tough competitors in choppy waters in Tokyo. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I was very happy with my first race. I came fifth out of six, and... Um, I mean, it's just kind of an honor to get to race against people like Sita who are world champions. Um, and that's kind of like a whole different level from, from where I'm at. So it's, it's pretty fun to get a race against them, even if you kind of get destroyed. <laughs> um, and then today my race wasn't so great. I ended up being blown by the wind into the buoys, um, which was pretty frustrating and disappointing. So I feel like I didn't do as well as I could have, but I'm ready to go out tomorrow and do better. Uh, tell us a little bit then about, about that Irish heritage because it's, it's kind of uh, garnered a few headlines over here for sure and I know your, your mother and father, uh, Moira and Jerry, uh, were missionaries yeah. that went over to Uganda. So maybe tell us a little bit about how all that came about and how Uganda became a part of your life. Yeah, so my parents are both, uh, both Irish. My dad's from the north, from Enniskillen. So I've got uh, my nanny there in Enniskillen and uh, my, my mom's parents are from Monaghan from Nublis. And so my parents both went to Trinity in Dublin for university. And then after that, when, when they were married, they uh, just felt a calling to work in Africa and Uganda is where, uh, where God led them. So 
they moved out there and they've been there for 20, 28 years almost now. Well, as a Monaghan man, where I'm absolutely going to be supporting you for the rest of the Olympics. Um, I didn't know that they, there was such a strong Monaghan link there as well. That's brilliant. Uh, great to hear. Um, for, for, for some people who might not be aware, Kathleen, of, of your background, it, you were actually a, a really, really strong swimmer before you got into rowing. Isn't that right? Yes. Yeah. So I grew up swimming uh, since I was about five years old. I was competing in swimming. And that's why I first represented Uganda was in swimming at the 2012 World Championships in Istanbul. I think I still have the national record for 50 fly, which is pretty, pretty cool to still hold that record. Um, and so that's kind of was my introduction into international sports. I really enjoyed competing for Uganda. I felt like sports more than anything has been the way that I felt very connected to Uganda and actually like feeling that identity of being Ugandan. I think in Uganda, it's very unusual for someone who's white to be Ugandan. And I think often there, people are very surprised when I tell them that. Uh, but I feel it's really like through the sporting world that I felt accepted and connected to that identity. Uh, and it, am I right in saying it was only when you were at uh, Princeton University that you eventually left the, left the water and got into the boat, I guess? Yes, that's, that's correct. I started rowing in university. Uh, what was that? What kind of inspired that move? I know, like you would have been, uh, as you said, a, a rower with, or sorry, a swimmer with, with serious, serious talent. So, uh, and rowing is such a tough sport. I mean, we've had uh, you know different rowers uh, on the show over the last uh, number of weeks. Even Nilo Tool, Irish rower, was on with us last night, and it's such a tough physical and mental sport. I mean, what what I guess inspired that decision to to get into rowing? Yeah, uh, initially it was that I, I when I went to university, I kind of decided that I wanted to leave swimming and I thought I wanted to kind of leave the world of competitive sports, just kind of to try something new because I dedicated so much time to that. But then I found I really missed it. I really missed the exercise and the discipline and the team. And my roommate, my first year at university was on the rowing team and she just loved it and she uh, suggested that I check it out. And so I did and I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed being outside, I really enjoyed um, how tough it was actually, just the chance to push yourself so hard. Like I had never pushed myself that hard before. And I remember that first year there would be winter training sessions on the on the ergometer and you would get done with it and you would throw up and you would lie and I would lie on the floor and I would just think I can never do that again. And then you come back next week and you do it again and you do better. and. Um, I guess because of, maybe because of my background in swimming, I did end up being quite good when I walked onto the team. And so uh, I actually represented Princeton at U.S. Nationals my first year as a novice walk-on, which is very unusual and was a very proud <laughs> moment for me to, to get that achievement. So um, it, it really felt like an area where I could push myself to the limit and maybe even past the limit. And, and, it, and it would just pay off and that was a really cool experience. I wonder then about the the individual aspect of, of what you're doing at the moment at the Olympics because I know at Princeton you would have been, uh, for example, part of an eight-person crew. And, and I look at, look at teams like, the, for example, the Irish women's hockey team over there together at the Olympics and there's kind of that team bond and team spirit. Whereas in rowing, you know, in single skulls rowing as, as you're doing, it's quite an individual sport. Like you would have been responsible for one oar at Princeton for a time and, and, and now, it's, now it's two oars, of course. So it's it's quite a... A, a tough sport mentally given the, the individual aspect to it as well. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I, I think my preference would be for team boats. If I if I could row in in a in a in a double or in a quad, I think I would really enjoy that. The, the truth is at the moment, Uganda, we don't have any other female rowers who are kind of at a level to compete. Um, internationally and, and we're working on that and hopefully in the future that'll change but for right now there, there just isn't that but I really love team boats and I miss that um, and I was training in Philadelphia recently and I got to race in a double with one of the, the US scholars there and that was just so much fun to have that energy of being with someone else at the boat. Um, uh, and uh, like I was texting your your coach Roderick um, Humuza last night and, and I know it was kind of a, a chance uh, almost visit by him from Uganda to the, to the US uh, that made him aware of of the fact that you were from Uganda and you had the the ability and the right to, to represent Uganda on on the international stage. So, uh, what what role did, did that visit his visit to America play in, in your decision to ultimately row for Uganda? Yeah, well, I, I had no idea Uganda had a rowing team. Probably till the Olympics, most of Uganda had no idea that Uganda had a rowing team. <laughs> it's a very small community at the moment, um, and so I guess 
running into him, uh, yeah, really just by chance that he ended up talking to one of my teammates who then said that, that I was part of the team and I was Ugandan. So then I met up with him uh, over Christmas when I was back in, in Uganda. And he was very excited and he was like, we're going to send you off to the World Championships. And I had been rowing for six months at that point. And I was like, I don't think I can do that. And I don't know how to scull. But it was kind of there in the back of my mind. And, and so actually the next year I took a I took a semester off from school and I did go home and I trained with the Ugandan team. Um, and that was a very challenging experience in many ways, but I'm so grateful for it because it, it allowed me to be part of that community in an active way and to participate in a lot of the, the struggles that, that they have there. And there are a lot of struggles and um, just kind of like the disappointments of things and the confusion and like I was, um, so they, they kind of said I was going to go to the world championships and that's a big reason why I took that semester off from school. And then I'd been training there for, for five months and then FISA kicked Uganda out of the World Rowing Federation because of our politics. And they said, oh, well, actually you can't go. Um, and so I just threw my hands up in the air and went to India and backpacked for a month and kind of, you know, didn't think anything was going to come of it. And then I come back and they're saying, oh, actually, maybe you can go. And so in the end, I didn't actually know that I was going to go to the World Championships until 10 days before the competition. And I was actually in Ireland at the time. Uh, I was at my grandparents' house in Monaghan in the countryside. And... Um, trying to train, which is really just like running, which wasn't really training. And then I was in Dublin and I went to commercial rowing club in, in Dublin. I just showed up there and I said, somebody help me and please let me use a boat. And so there were two guys there, Fergus and Billy, who were so kind to me. And this is like 10 days before the beginning of the competition. I had never been in a racing single before, only in a bigger training boat, which is like 35 kilos and a racing shell is 14 kilos. So much smaller, much less stable. And so, um, those guys at commercial were just so fantastic, helped me out, taught me how to <laughs> how to manage my tiny little boat and do starts and stuff. And uh, so it ended up being a big adventure, but certainly like um, I feel the struggle that, that the Ugandan athletes experience and the disappointments of being told things and then, then changing. So um, I don't know where this started, but. Like it, it's so, it's fascinating to me because by all accounts, the, the, the Princeton Boathouse is, is one of the best rowing facilities in the world. Uh, and then you're going to Uganda. I mean, uh, presumably that the facilities were, were, were nowhere near what they were at Princeton. I mean, that must have been quite a, a humbling experience almost. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose like I grew up in Uganda, so I, I kind of, I, I knew, um, I knew the facilities were not going to be like Princeton. Um, and I was, I mean, I was happy enough with what we have, but we, we really don't have very much. And even the boats that we do have, you know, sometimes you got to stick them with duct tape because they're getting a hole in them and that's all you can do. And, um, so there, there's, it was definitely a very, you got to try to ch change your mindset, you know, mm -hmm. and, and readjust to what it was. And, um, it was still a good training opportunity, um, but certainly, like, I'm very hopeful that in the future, Uganda can get more, more equipment um, and actually be able to grow the sport. Because right now, we probably only have, you know, like, five boats or something like that. I mean, you mentioned that Uganda has, a, has the small rowing community, but for people over here, they might not even realize Uganda is a country of 45 million people. Um, like... There's clearly a lot of pride in Uganda, and you were the first the first rower to represent Uganda at the Olympic Games as well. Um, and, yeah. and look, and, and the first Ugandan athlete, I think, at this Tokyo Olympics to, to compete. So that must have been quite a quite a big moment for people in Uganda. And I, I, like I've even seen Uganda newspapers and media covering it quite extensively. It's a, it's a big story over there. Yeah, yeah, it's been really exciting for the Ugandan rowing community, and just um, I think. A lot of people back home are really excited about it, more so even than I, I expected. So it's been um, really cool to see to see that energy. And, and like for a lot of people, taking part in the Olympics is 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 more than enough. I mean, clearly that the a lot of elite athletes are going for medals and talking about top ten finishes and that sort of thing. But for you to be in an Olympic Games, like is that? Is it all you ever dreamed of? Is it uh, is it something that you, that you always had ambitions for, or is it kind of cropped up uh, almost unexpectedly? I think for rowing, it was pretty unexpected. I think when I was growing up swimming, it was something that was in my mind as as a possible goal. And then I, I guess when I moved on from swimming, I just didn't expect it to be a possibility. And so 
it's definitely a surprise to be, to be here, um, especially, you know, picking up the sport so late. Uh, I feel like usually when people make it to the Olympics, they've been doing it since they were five years old, but rowing is unique in that, in that way that you can start it later and do very well. Uh, and even in, in Salt Lake City, uh, where, where you're based in, in Utah, I mean, there aren't many waterways in, in Utah, quite a, an arid, a hot place. So I know you train in the, in the, in the Jordan River. Um, like, what's that like, uh, you know, being a, a rower in a state like Utah that is not renowned exactly for its, uh, for its waterways? It, yeah, it definitely has its challenges. We have, uh, so our stretch of river is about 1,700 meters, and it's between sort of like a chemical factory plant and an industrial wasteland. It's kind of a cool juxtaposition, though, because you have these gorgeous big mountains in the background, but then, you know, you've got this, like, chemical plant spewing out ammonia or something sometimes. So, um, but yeah, there's not a lot of rowing in, in Salt Lake City. I train with a high school team there, which is, it's a competitive team. They uh, have gotten medals at nationals before. And that's kind of like the the highest level of rowing that is in, in Utah. So I really enjoy training with, with that high school team. But it is definitely different, you know, to being at a high performance program. I got an opportunity to, to go to two different American high performance programs just in the in the two months leading up to the Olympics. Um, and it's, it's definitely a different experience when you have, you know, your boathouse that's right by the water, whereas we have to carry our boats across the road and we like have the launch and we bring it on a trolley and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bit more like Uganda, I guess, in a way. Yeah, like I even, I read a quote from uh, Hassan Iqbal, who's, who's I know involved with, with you over there in Salt Lake City, and uh, he was saying, he was talking about your, your origins in rowing and, and what you bring to the sport, and he said, uh, she seemed very determined, and to me, that's such a key part. If you're doing it because it's cool, that's not going to do it. Like, clearly you're someone who's uh, committed, dedicated, and has the, the mental capacity and fortitude to take part in this sport because as i said earlier it's it's uh, far from an easy sport yeah it is it is brutal and like there's there's been times that i've done races and i ended up being like seriously sick after them and it's just kind of like you wonder why do i do this to myself but then you come back and you do it again <laughs> so it, it, but there's something about that toughness you know just seeing like how far can i push myself yeah, like even uh, listening to Nilo Tool talking off the ball last night, like a former Olympian himself, um, he spoke about this, the, the old East German analogy where, you know, trying to pick, uh, you know, a, a double skulls rowing team and thro almost throwing eight eggs against the wall and seeing which two stick. Like it's, it's that kind of tough, tough training uh, that really only, only the best come through. Yeah, and you certainly see that, I guess, like um, when I walked onto the team at Princeton, you know, you have maybe like 25 people that join at the beginning of the year, but then like at the end of the year, there's only five that are still with it. Um, so anyone can join, but you got to stick with it, and a lot of people don't. Like you've been involved as well, um, uh, just uh, as if you weren't busy enough in in, in cancer research and uh, uh, physical therapy while you were training in Utah. And I know you have been working as a technician in, in the is it the Huntsman Institute in, in, in Salt Lake City as well. Like that must be, uh, I'd imagine, very tough but rewarding work as well. Yeah, um, I mean, so working in cancer research, it's been an, it was interesting to kind of see behind behind the scenes of that because. The reality of that kind of work, you know, it's just a lot of the same thing. A lot of looking after yourselves day in and day out and then doing experiments and repeating them over and over again. So I would say, like, it's not very rewarding on the day to day. And because it's such a slow process, you know, you got to stick with it for many years, I think, before you see see any really rewarding results. So I, I really have a lot of respect for people who, who do that, but I that's not going to be my path. <laughs> Like it's 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 incredible work and and like it's something that I'm sure. Uh, do you find it hard to balance the, the your work in the cancer research with with the rowing? As it, um, it like rowing is such a sport that you need to commit so many hours to. Is it is it tough to find the balance between the the work and the life? Uh, I mean, it was it was challenging at times, certainly when I was working full time uh, at the lab. But it, it, my bosses were really supportive, and I was able to kind of do my hours in such a way that I could could be free for the time that I needed to train. And so I was really grateful for that flexibility. Um, but then you do, all you do is like row, sleep and go to work. 
Absolutely, I can imagine. I mean, and I saw you talking as well about the, the before you headed over to Tokyo, the, the choppy waters in Tokyo and the crosswinds and how the conditions were expected to be and, and usually are in Tokyo Bay quite tough. Has that lived up, lived up to your expectations? Has it been tougher or slightly easier than maybe you thought? <laughs> It has been it has been much easier than I expected. The crosswind is annoying, and I'm not used to to that. But uh, the chop has not been what I was expecting at all. So that has been a pleasant surprise. Uh, finally, Kathleen, you've been great with your time. I know you're 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 only out of dinner, and and the, the hours are a little bit different over there. So I will let you get back to it. But have you had a chance to chat to any of the Irish athletes? I know you were in the heat, for example, with Sunita Paspur. Have you discussed your Irish uh, links and heritage with her at all? Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't had a chance to talk to, to talk to them. I think one of the coaches came up to me today and was saying, "Oh, I saw you in the in the Irish news." So that was that was kind of nice. I would love to chat to them. I feel like something with you know with COVID things have been very socially restricted, and so you don't really have an opportunity to to interact with other teams very much. Um, but you know, maybe maybe I should go find them and say hello. <laughs> I would like that. Absolutely, say hello. Well, listen, Kathleen, we'll. Uh, we'll be firmly following. I know your, your, hopefully your, your Irish ancestors and family over here will be uh, listening in and, and uh, following all your exploits on uh, Irish media as well as over in the Olympics as well. You've been, you've been great with your time and we will be firmly following your, uh, your endeavours over the next while, not just in the Olympics, but uh, going forward. So thanks a million for your time, Kathleen. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Great stuff. Kathleen Noble there, the uh, Irish, we're going to call her Irish, Irish Ugandan, Irish Ugandan American uh, rower. So uh, the best of luck to uh, Kathleen with everything else. As I said, this is uh, the Olympics show on uh, OTB Sports with Indeed, proud partner of Team Ireland, live every day across the next th three weeks, across all of our social channels. All with thanks to Indeed, proud to support Team Ireland at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Indeed believes that the world works better when people are given every opportunity to unleash their true talents. The hashtag is Talent Unleashed. The Olympic show on OTB Sports with Indeed, proud partner of Team Ireland. Screen time. They're the band that only half the world have ever heard of. But Sparks have been making music for 50 years. And finally, they get their own.